was the Germans. Um, it was their last last try to um, drive the Allies out of out of Europe, and they um, threw most of their divisions at one point in uh, in this um, this kind of wall that the um, that the 106th Infantry Division had set up. Did you know that because of me? How did you know it was 106? Uh, I think it wasn't my dad that told me that. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> somebody told me about this outfit, and uh, 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 I, yeah. I told him to Google it. Because uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll and tell you to Google it. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. And so um, all of the German divisions that they were attacking with went into one point in the uh, in the line and made a big bulge in it, which is why it was called the Battle of the Bulge, and um, and captured a lot of Allied soldiers, and uh, eventually they were driven back by Patton's army, who uh, was sent in to uh, stop the Germans. Yeah, well, Patton was, uh, that's right, that's good. Patton did push them back, but that was after the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, if, yeah, after the yeah, Battle of the Bulge. That was after the Battle of the Bulge. He was, he was actually on his way, he was down in, in the southern part of Europe, and he was moving his troops up to where this was going on. And he didn't get there in time for the, uh, the breakthrough, but he did put it, he, he was responsible for pushing it back. Uh, but let, then, then let's, let me see what kind of questions you have. Okay. Uh, that gives me some idea. You're, you're familiar generally. Yeah. Well, my first question is, uh, what service were you in? The infantry. And what was your rank at your entry? I was a, uh, uh, I was a staff sergeant. And? I, I was a, uh, uh, and I was in an entry, infantry uh, division, which was the 106th Infantry Division. And, uh, and I was the uh, staff sergeant, and I was the supply sergeant for our, for our company. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was your rank at discharge? Tech sergeant. And why were you promoted? Uh, I guess I thought, I, I think at that time, and, and most prisoners of war, I believe, were automatically promoted when they, uh, when they were discharged. And uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. And how many years did you serve during the war? I went into the army in uh, April of uh, forty, April forty-three, and uh, till uh, till uh, December of forty-five, when I was. Uh, Actually, I was captured in December of '45, and then I escaped in uh, uh, in April. And uh, what was your military job? Start a supply sergeant. And how much training did you have? None. <laughs> <laughs> and no, really, you? none. <laughs> I'll tell you about it afterwards. Okay. And uh, were you injured at all during combat? Did you receive any medals? Uh, I, I think just the European theater and uh, nothing for bravery. <laughs> That's what you want. <laughs> and where did you serve, uh, if you could name each important place? Well, really, it, there wasn't that much. Uh, uh, you mean in the actual war or yeah. in the army? In the actual war. Um, was at, uh, well, let me back up then. Mm -hmm. uh, the 106th Infantry Division was put together by, uh, the, the war was going poorly, and they needed people, they needed men. And at that time, I was in the, uh, I was in the Air Force. And I had been transferred from the field artillery to the Air Force. And uh, because I requested it, and I wanted to be in the Air Force, but when they were having so much trouble, and they were, they were the Germans were giving them a real rough time, uh, they, uh, they, they told, they, they told their, their uh, generals, 
we want all able-bodied men back in the infantry. We need them in the infantry. We don't need them in the Air Force. So I was transferred back into the infantry at Fort Riley or at uh, Camp Atterbury, Indiana. Uh, and uh, as a result, here were all these soldiers coming in from all different parts of everywhere. And uh, there were medics that they had in there for fighting in the infantry. They had, it was so screwed up. I mean, it was so, there was just no sense to what they, was, was being done. But they had the people, they had the men. And they had uh, three, uh, uh, three regiments in, the, uh, in this division. And when, and we had little or no training at all at uh, Camp Atterbury. The only infantry training I had was at, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, training there in, uh, when we were first, when we first went to the, in the Army, but that was very little. So um, we, we were a bunch of nobodies. And uh, they thought that, and we were sent to England to go to the, the, the front. First, we were going. We went to England first, and then we were to go to the front. Well, we we went to into uh, Cherbourg, and we were moved up into Belgium, and we replaced the first infantry division. The first infantry division was a crack, uh, uh, a crack division. I mean, they they fought. They were one of the best divisions in the army, but they were tired, and they had been beaten up, and they were they needed a rest. So our generals thought that it would be safe to move us up into their position and let them come back and, and get, get the rest, get the rest that they needed. So here we were, an infantry division, where we didn't even know each other, and, uh, uh, and we took the place of this, right in the center, in the Hurkin Forest, we moved into their positions. And the Germans were no fools. They knew that this was going on. They knew that, that, happened, that this had happened. We didn't know that they knew, but we, they did know. And they knew that here was this division that was taking up a big section of the, um, uh, uh, the Herkin, in the Hurkin Forest. And that we didn't know what we were doing. And that's where they, that's where they struck. And they struck at, on December 16th, and uh, and when uh, when they struck, the uh, captain in charge of our company said, "Okay, guys, you're on your own. Go where you go. Go, just go. No instructions. No nothing. Go." And because I was a supply sergeant, I had a jeep, and I was the only one who had the jeep in the company. There was only one, one jeep in, to each company. So I had the jeep and I uh, uh, let people, uh, as many people as I could, hang on to the jeep and we would start down one road and we didn't know where we were going. We had no idea where we were going. And, uh, uh, and then we would go another way and get dark and we would wait and, 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 uh, and we, we were running around for a couple of days. We, we, we had no idea what we were doing. And, uh, uh, and all of a sudden, we, we, we um, saw a, uh, an American tank company. And we thought, well, maybe they know something. And we hooked up with them. And before we knew it, we were crossing a clearing. And we were totally and completely surrounded by the Germans by their tanks, and we were an anti-tank company, <laughs> but it didn't, didn't help anything. So we didn't know what to do, so I, all I know is I jumped out of my Jeep, and I got down on the ground, flat on the ground, and I'm looking around to see what was going on, and I see that all the GIs were waving handkerchiefs. I didn't know why, but I assumed that, that was the thing to do. And I started to wave my handkerchief, and at the same time, I tore up my dog tags, 
and I buried them because I didn't want them to know I was a Jew. You know, of course, or do you know yeah. uh, what the Germans thought about the Jews? And uh, and we were captured. They were so we were surrounded, and we were captured. The first night, they moved us into a a pig pen that was just awful, and uh, and we spent the night there. And then they moved they moved us into a uh, into a camp. Uh, it was called Camp Four Four B. We were only in this camp for about two weeks because they were taking they were taking so many prisoners. They didn't know where to, where to put them. They didn't know what to, what to do with them. So uh, they uh, uh, they they put us in. The, so after we were there for about two weeks, they lined us up and they uh, said we were going somewhere. We were going to we were going to be on a march. Well, we were on a march, all right. We were captured in uh, in uh, Belgium, uh, you know, near Liège, Belgium, and. For five months, we walked. We marched every day, and uh, there were uh, there were uh, they were they put us in groups of a hundred, ten across, ten back. So there, there were a hundred, and in our group there were sixteen groups, and we were guarded by the the uh, the uh, uh, the home guard. They were these older men who couldn't go into the who wouldn't fit in the army or couldn't go in the army, but they carried their rifles and they knew what to do. They kept they kept order. And fortunately, fortunately I had a, a, a buddy who uh, and, and and if you were captured in a field jacket, just a jacket, this is cold in winter. This was in December and it was cold and it was snowing, it was awful. But if you were captured in a um, and a uh, field jacket, uh, uh, you were in trouble because you couldn't, you would freeze. And uh, but if you were captured in an overcoat, which I was, and my buddy was captured in an overcoat, most of the nights that we were there, uh, we we were we slept out in the field, and this buddy of mine and I would tie or uh, button our overcoats together. And keep ourselves warm by just body heat, you know, just, just to keep yourself warm. And once in a while, they would take us into a town in Germany. Uh, all the farmlands are uh, out in the country, and the farmers live in these little towns. And then in the morning, when they go to take care of their farms, they would have to they would go out and take care of them. Uh, but once in a while, they would put us in a uh, up in a barn, up in a haymow, or something like that. And that was like being in a Four Seasons hotel. I mean, that was that was fantastic. You got that. But uh, I'll tell you one story that happened there. I'm not going to go into any great detail. But this one story, we of course had nothing to eat. We we were starved. Uh, once in a while. We would get a uh, uh, about every two days. They would take our group of a hundred, and they would they would take a loaf of bread that was more sawdust than it was bread. It was it was it tasted great because they were so hungry. But and they would <coughs> give the one on each end of their line a loaf of this bread, and they would say, "Okay, divide it up." Well, now how are they going <laughs> to? And it fights over that bread. And, and, and one of the other things that I found out that our GIs were the best crooks that you could find. Because the, when I first saw this, I would put the bread in my pocket and, uh, and think that I would just ration myself. Just whatever bread I got, I'd ration myself. That didn't work because I would go to sleep. And when I'd wake up, the bread was out of my pocket. It was gone. They, they could, they, they were really unbelievable. So uh, uh, we were really in bad shape. And this one night we were in one of these places. My buddy said that he had to go out and go to the latrine. 
and, uh, and, and I said, that's fine. And he didn't come back for a long time. And when he came, and I thought maybe either they caught him or he did something, or I, he, he was very brave. I mean, he would do anything. And he, so he, what he had done, he was a farmer. He lived in Johnson, Vermont. He was a farmer boy. And he went into the chicken coop without disturbing the chickens. And he grabbed a chicken, twisted the neck like that, killed the chicken in his hands. And he did it again for the second time with another chicken. And he came rushing, he came back, and he says, George, what I got? And he, I put my hand out, and here was his chicken. He, he one for him and one for me. Believe it or not, we, we sat there and pulled the feathers out, and we ate that chicken raw as much as we could. And, and then we carried the bones with us for, oh, maybe three weeks until they got rotten. We thought maybe we could get some water somewhere and make some chicken soup or something. <laughs> we didn't know, but that, that was just, but these were kinds of things that, uh, that, that were going on. But that's not, that gets away from the Battle of the Bulge. I mean, uh, uh, as far, but that was the end of our, our uh, uh, activity as far as the Battle of the Bulge is concerned. And the other part was as a prisoner of war, which was, uh, which was an ordeal in itself. So, do you have any questions? Uh, so, the Battle of the Bulge was the only actual battle that you That's fought right. in? Okay. Let's see, I think you answered a lot of them. Uh, so, how, how were most of the days spent in the prisoner of war camps? There was no camp. We marched. <clears throat> we walked. We walked uh, from um, uh, from Belgium all the way across Germany to the Oder River, and then we heard the Russians coming from the other way. And they turned us around and they walked us all the way back to where we started. We walked over 800 miles in uh, in Germany with, without any with little or no nothing to eat. Wow! <laughs> so it was. Uh, I'll tell you this: I weighed 205 pounds when I went overseas. I weighed 128 when I, after we were, after we were uh, uh, captured, and after we were uh, uh, escaped, and we went back and we got into the American lines, and uh, and I was uh, uh, I was way weigh, uh, weighed there, and I weighed 128. Yeah. yeah any more questions? Well, uh, oh, I forgot something. Uh, how old were you when you enlisted in the Army? 25. No, let's see. No, I was younger than that. I went in in, uh, in uh, 43, and I was 20, 22. Let's see. Uh, so what helped you get through the tough times in the uh, when you were a prisoner of war? Well, I think I gave you that. I, I gave, they gave you a loaf of bread once in a while. And there was no help. They, and once in a while, you would get a soup. I'd have a big kettle and give you some, give you some soup. Do you mean mentally, Duncan? Well, uh, hmm? that's what yeah, I think. Yeah, I guess mentally. mentally. Oh, mentally? Yeah. What help? Yeah, or like, um, like what did you do maybe to entertain yourself? All right, that's a good question. I'll tell you what I did when we were marching. I ate three full meals a day <laughs> in my mind. That's true. In the morning, I would have my breakfast, and I was going to have orange juice, but the way I could stretch it out, I would plant the seeds for the tree, and I would watch the tree go, and that made me take me a certain length of time. When the tree grew, then there were these orange blossoms, and I enjoyed the orange blossoms, and I, uh, and then finally, when their oranges uh, came on the trees, and I would have uh, uh, squeezes, squeeze the orange. It could take me an hour to have breakfast, walking while we're while we're walking. Lunch, I do the same thing, and dinner, I did the same thing. I'd have a bit something different for lunch every day, something different different for for uh, for uh, dinner uh, every day, and then I and I went to the, my favorite soda fountain every night for a, uh, a chocolate soda. That's the way you did it. That's the way I did it. And I just kept my mind.
I'm going? That's a good question. Let's see. Uh, so, uh, did the Germans' behaviors change towards you as VE Day was approaching? As VE Day was approaching, we didn't have any contact with the German soldiers. Uh, we were we were on this march, and then we escaped, and the next thing we knew, we saw this uh, a company of GIs, and we we went to them. And they recognized us as Americans, and uh, so we had no contact with the Germans. So how did you escape? Oh, that's another story. I don't know. That's the story that uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, I told you that we that we would uh, sleep out in the fields at night, and that uh, and every morning that you'd wake up, you would look around the fields and see who wasn't getting up, who died during the, during the night. And uh, when the uh, uh, and when we got to the point where there were 1,600 of us, there were eight, there were 16 groups of 100. Now it's down to about eight groups, and eight groups of 100 had died. They died from either starvation, or a lot of them died because they couldn't stop smoking. And if you had cigarettes, you were a rich man. I mean, you really were. And if you needed something, uh, they, they, you would walk around to where everybody was. For example, let's say that you were captured without a, a wool cap. There were wool caps that we had that we wore under our steel helmets. You'd walk around, you'd say, cigarettes for, for, cigarettes for cap, cigarettes for cap. And whoever wanted to give you the, the uh, cap, you would negotiate with them and they would take the cigarette and they'd give you the cap. Uh, uh, plenty of them died because they couldn't quit smoking. And they say that it isn't, uh, that, it, that it isn't habit forming. Can you imagine that? <laughs> uh, anyhow, uh, it got down to where there were only about 800 of us left. And we were still marching. And I had this one buddy and another fellow who was with us too, and they wanted to escape. And I said, well, where are you going to go? Well, you don't know where to go. There's, there's no, we don't even know where we are. And all we knew is that we heard the Russians and they turned us around and started us back. And I said to them that I will go with you only when I hear that they're there is American artillery. If we hear that the Amer we're close to the Americans, and then we know where we're going, because we know the direction they're coming from, then we'll, we'll try it. And, uh, and not too long after that, a few days after that, we heard the American artillery. And we had already been turned around and coming back the other way, and that's how we knew that it was the American artillery. And uh, we, uh, we agreed that what we would do was we would walk along the road as we walked. There were no vehicles, nobody had cars, there were no cars on the roads. Nobody had gas, they don't know, everything went to the army. And we said that when we get to a place where there is a woods along the road, uh, that what we would do is that we would fall out and fall in a ditch and we would uh, and let the rest of the group go by. Because people were doing that all the time. People fell out and died right there on the street, on, on the roads. So the three of us each picked a time that we, would, that we would do that, and that's what we did. And when the Germans saw that we were down there, they came after us with their rifles, these older men, and beat on us. Uh, uh, with, the, with the butt of their rifles. And I'll tell you, if you know that your life is just about, it's just about at it, you're, you can 
almost make yourself do something that you couldn't believe that you could do, and that was not to move, to be dead, even when they hit you. And, they, and when they would think they had the, they had the enough hitting, they would go on their way and leave you. Well, they did. They, the, the three of us, wound up in this woods. And uh, and and, uh, and then we saw some lights, and we saw we were near a village. God, I haven't told this for so long. You know, I, this is something that I've never, I never thought I'd do. <laughs> But it's for you and for you. Uh, we saw this village, and we went into the village, and nobody could speak German. I had a little German, not German, but I could speak Yiddish a little bit. But we stayed for three nights in this in the woods until the GIs came up. And when we saw them, they looked at us at first, and they, they didn't weren't sure who we were because understand we were captured in December and we were wearing the same clothes that we had on in April. Never a shower, never never an opportunity to wash. Uh, once in a while if you found a razor with somebody and they let you use it you could shave. But we were just a mess and we were covered with lice. Uh, and, uh, and the lice would bite, and a lot of and a lot of soldiers died from that. Our division, or our uh, our division, had the distinction of being the only division in the 106th Infantry. There were two divisions, or two two regiments. There were only uh, we had the distinction of being the only one that uh, you were either killed or captured. That's how bad it was. There wasn't anybody that that, uh, that uh, survived, and the general who was in charge of our division went running somewhere, and I think he was eventually court-martialed. But it was uh, it was a mess. Fed up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, so, has your view of the experience changed now with the passage of time? Oh sure, I, I don't have. I had. Uh, I, 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 I hated the Germans for a while. I wouldn't buy anything German. I wouldn't do anything with any. Uh, just the sound of their voices would uh, get to me. But now time's passed, and, and uh, I think that they've done. Uh, they have. Uh, They've acted well, and they're friends of Israel today, and there are good things that are happening. Have you ever been back? I went back once with my brother-in-law. We were I took our family uh, for a trip in, in Europe, and he, and he was getting a new Mercedes, and he said, "If you go pick up the Mercedes, you can use it in his in uh, in, in his size." So I, I thought, "Well, for that I'll go." And I did, and I picked up his in Munich, and uh, that's the only time. As a matter of fact, we had a, a reservation to go to Berlin. Uh, supposed to be there right now, and I canceled it, not because of that, but because I just didn't feel up to making the trip. So I'm, I, I, don't, I don't harbor any great great grudges anymore. I did for a while. And uh, who did you rely on most during your experiences? Me? Mm -hmm. Me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what were the ideas that you were fighting for? Well, Hitler was, uh, a, 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 he was taking over Europe. He took, went into Poland, he went into the Czech, the Czech, the Czechoslovakia, he, he went into France, he, he went and uh, marched down the Champs Elysees in, in Paris. And, and uh, he was about to take over all of uh, all of Europe, and of course we didn't know at the time that there were these concentration camps. I don't know. Are you familiar with the concentration yeah. camps? Well, if you were to 
Jewish Museum. You were, yeah. you were familiar with it. Like Have you ever been there? The Jewish Museum. Auschwitz. Yeah. Auschwitz, like yeah. That. Auschwitz. That's exactly. I would, we did go. I did go back there once uh, with the Federation, with the Jewish Community Federation, um, and we went to Auschwitz. When I've been there, but uh, when we were first captured, and they took us out of that pig pen, they put us in a box cars and a train and a train, and we were on the train I think for three or four days, with no. No plumbing or no nothing, nothing to eat. That's another nightmare. I keep thinking about these things. Uh, so, what would our world be like today if the U.S. had not entered the war? Oh, God, I don't know, Lord knows. This man was a, uh, he was an animal. He, he just, Wanted to capture the world. I mean, we're starting to we're starting to uh, uh, experience things like that now, again after all these years. What with Iran and, and Iraq mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, all the things that we're going through now, we didn't we didn't learn the lesson. Now we're still having to learn that lesson. Uh, so, what did you do after the war? I came back, I was a prisoner, and I was taken to, <laughs> I was put in, they, they tried to place us in the uh, closest camp to where you lived, and I lived in Pennsylvania, so they put me at, at, uh, at a, uh, in, a, in a hospital in Pennsylvania, because we were, I was in not very good shape, I had, had, had uh, uh, yellow jaundice, and I was, I was not, wasn't very good. At any rate, I wanted, I didn't want to go to Valley Forge is where we were, we were sent. And I didn't want to go to Valley Forge. I wanted to go back to Camp Atterbury to where my girlfriend was. And uh, so I decided that I'm going to get to Camp Atterbury somehow, some way. And uh, I started by having these terrible dreams at night, which I was faking. And they would wake me up, and they thought I was asleep, but I wasn't asleep, and I just was in such bad shape uh, that uh, they gave me some psychiatric uh, treatment. And, and they said, well, you're going to have to go to a rehabilitation uh, place. And I knew that Gap Atterbury uh, had a, a rehabilitation place for uh, psychiatric people. So I knew that because I dated a girl in in the, in the hospital there who was in charge of uh, of, of telling people or or, or uh, put, assigning them to different places, and I uh, and she said that she would assign me to Camp Atterbury, which she did. So I went back to Camp Atterbury and and I was with my girlfriend and I. They belong to a wonderful country club, and I play golf. <laughs> <laughs> Great way to yeah. solve those mental problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I, and my my parents, my parents were um, were not in good shape when I came back because they had been so upset with what was going on. And uh, they had a. We lived in a tiny little town in Pennsylvania, and my father had. Uh, a ready-to-wear store, men's, women's, and children's clothing, in the small in the small town, and, and another one in another town. And I knew nothing about that business. I was never involved in it. But but he couldn't. He just was so. He just had to get away. So he and my mother went to Florida, and they said it's yours to take care of. <laughs> That's another story, that, which I did, and and. Uh, and then I, uh, uh, then I, uh, the, the, my, the girlfriend that I had there, that's the end of the story. She, her parents were very much opposed to me because I lived in this tiny little town and she was a real catch in Indianapolis. 
and she could have had anybody she wanted because she was so popular. But she wanted to get married, and I did too. But our parents broke it up. So when they broke it up, my wife today was her roommate. <laughs> and we've been married for 60 years. <laughs> so, that's the end of the story. Is that enough? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll give you what you needed. So, uh, what were the lasting effects or impacts of the war on you? They were positive. Uh, before I went to the Army, I was so spoiled. My father was an immigrant from Russia, and he came here when he was nine years old, and he never had a childhood. So. He wanted to live his life through me and, and live his childhood through me. And he, his, his, his job was, he felt, to give me everything I wanted, anything that I wanted, and try to anticipate what I wanted, not just what I wanted, but what I anticipated. And he was, and of course, I took advantage of it, and I was very spoiled. And uh, matter of fact, when I went to when I went to uh, when I graduated from high school, uh, and I went to a, a, a prep school called Mercersburg Academy in Pennsylvania. My father came over there and opened a store in that little town, so he could have an excuse to come over there because he had a store there. And I played football on the on the. Uh, Mercersburg team, and uh, he would come. He would. It was only about 50 miles from where we lived, and he would come over just to watch practice and never missed a game. He came over. That was, so the point that I'm making is, uh, I realized that uh, when I came out of college uh, and went through the war, how fortunate I was, and I think that the war. Uh, made a man out of me. Uh, I don't know what I would have been if I hadn't. Uh, in other words, that uh, I appreciated uh, what I had and, and took uh, great pleasure in what I had. And I was, and I was. Uh, so I think it had a, an overall positive effect on me. And so these are good questions. Uh, is there anything else you'd like me to know about your World War II experience? No. You know more than most people. Because <laughs> I don't talk like this very often. Yeah. Very rarely. My own family, my own family didn't hear it for years. And I started telling them little bits about it, but they didn't. I just didn't feel like I wanted to talk about it. But the interesting part about it is that this fellow who was my buddy, when I was taking my family back east, and they were my three children and my wife, and we were going back east to go to the, to, uh, to the, uh, the Boston and all, and do all those things together. And he lived in Johnson, Vermont. And I uh, uh, called him and asked him if we could come see him. And we did, and we had dinner at their house. And we were having dinner, he started to tell the same stories that I told him. Because I don't think they had believed me in the beginning. Because <laughs> you know, I, I told him the chicken story. And he told the chicken story. And they said, well, I think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> was he one of the two guys that yeah. you escaped with? Yeah. What was his name? John Waitman. John Waitman. John. Waitman, and he, uh, we st we stayed in touch for a long time. We'd send and exchange Christmas cards, and be in touch, and, and as a matter of fact, he named his son George after me, and uh, and his son went to West Point, and uh, did did very very well. He's no longer living, because we were back east and. 
uh, two years ago when I tried to reach him. And uh, there were other people by that name, but he was no longer there. Do you know what happened to the group that you escaped from thereafter? Were they liberated shortly afterwards? or? I don't know. I have no idea. I do know that if I had not taken my dog tags off, when I was interrogated, they had, uh, was a, a, pr a prisoner who had been captured at Dunkirk, and he was already uh, working for the for the Germans, doing some t uh, some some work. You know, that was nothing that that special. One of the things is his job was to interview and to, uh, and to interrogate the prisoners of war. And when I came in to, to be interrogated by him, one of the questions he asked me was, what is your religion? And I said, Jewish. And he said, well, you know what the Germans feel about the Jews. I said, yeah, but you asked me my religion and I'm telling you this is, I'm Jewish. And he, and, and uh, and he said, well, I'm going to tell you something. He says, there's nothing derogatory, and I remember him using that word, nothing derogatory towards you nor towards your religion, but I have yet to write down Jewish for anybody, and as, for, as of now, you're a Protestant. <laughs> and, and that's a fact. And as a result, I wasn't sent to a work camp. I had friends who were sent to work camps because they, that's where they went, all the Jews they knew. They sent them to work camps. And okay, we're up. Okay, so my final question for you is, uh, what, are, what are your views on the war in Iraq? Let's get out of there as fast as we can. Absolutely. I don't think it can be one militarily. I don't agree with the McCain. And uh, the fact that we have a... I must tell you, I was totally against it from before, before he went in. But that was a bad mistake, bad mistake, one of the worst ever. Mm -hmm. uh, okay.